Welcome to the Tanya Acker Show. My guest today is Mo Bella. He is a former senior advisor to then Vice President Biden, and he's going to talk to us today about how he thinks the president is doing and how it is one can compromise in an environment that is, uh, shall we say, as charged and divided uh, as the political environment is today. We also talk about his new show. Uh, he is one of the co-hosts and a producer on a new show called Unicorn Hunters, uh, which gives everybody, viewers everywhere, an opportunity uh, to participate in the American dream and to uh, perhaps invest in new businesses uh, that Mo and his co-hosts will vet uh, for themselves and for the audience. And um, we also talked about how it is you can pick yourself up uh, when things are dark and hard and uh, use it, uh, use those moments to propel yourself to something greater as Mo did. So here I am with the wonderful Mo Bella. Welcome to the podcast, Mo Vela, former senior advisor to then Vice President Biden. Mo Vela, welcome to the show. Well, right, Tanya, it's good to be with you. I mentioned that you were a former uh, senior advisor to then Vice President Biden. You're also the producer right. and show panelist for a new television show, a business reality series, a business mm -hmm. reality series called Unicorn Hunters. I yeah. definitely want to talk to you about that. Uh, I can't um, wait. <laughs> let's first uh, talk about your former boss. Uh, sure. You, when you worked for uh, Joe Biden, he was vice president. Now he's That's the right. president. Uh, give us a report card. What's a grade? Uh, since he started office, yeah. what First would you give him? First in five days, I guess, or something like that right now, right? Yeah, 100 you know, and look, some. Give him a grade. Yeah, 100 and some. You know, Tanya, I, um, first of all, let me start by saying this. I have the utmost respect uh, for the Bidens. They are uh, real. They're gracious, they're kind, uh, and they're just soulful, beautiful people, both Dr. Biden and the president. Um, I The grade I give them, honestly, is an A minus. I would give them an A plus, except that, you know what, I don't think, if you give an A plus at 100 or whatever day mark, what the hell do you have to work for? Yet, right? <laughs> So I saw something that you, uh, it was either an interview that you gave on television um, mm -hmm. or uh, in print. But one yeah. of the things you said was that you thought that this president, because of his temperament and his experience, mm -hmm. would be really well positioned to work with folks on the other side of the aisle and yeah. get things done. Uh, do you still believe that? Because I we do. haven't seen I, that so far. I, I know, and it's a very good question. I'm glad you brought it up, because here's the deal. I think people are criticizing him a little bit because of that, but here's the reality. Come on, you know, as a, as a gay Latino, right? I have to tell you, you can only work with people who are willing to work with you, right? <laughs> You can only, you can reach out, you can extend a hand, you can share love, you can open your heart and your soul and your, your soul and mind. And that is what Joe Biden does every day of his life, by the way. I, having worked for him, you know, very closely as his uh, director of management and administration and senior advisor, the man every day has an open heart, open mind, open soul, and full of love. Now, you know this, Tanya, come on, we can have that. You have it clearly with your successful career. You wouldn't have gotten to where you're at if you didn't share those values and traits. But you know, dad gum well, that if it's not received, right? And if the person on the other side doesn't share that value or doesn't return those emotions, what the hell are you going to do? So that goes to my question. Look, uh, you're a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Yep. We both have been in situations where yep. you've got somebody on the other side of the table who you might find abhorrent, who your yep. client might think is despicable. But at the end That's of the right. day, you have a process in which both sides agree to submit to certain rules. If you lose, I mean, there are some rare occasions, I guess, where, you know, you might say, 
say the process was corrupt or the judge did yeah. something wrong. People move to disqualify judges all the time. But right. at the end of the day, both sides have some respect for the rules, for the process, for the outcome, and they don't assume that it's a corrupt process just because they lost. I mean, That's right. look, if every time, if when I was practicing actively and I had a client and whenever we lost, I went back to the client and said, you know what? The process is just corrupt. Exactly. That just doesn't fly when you are playing I in agree. other arenas. It flies these days in Washington. So how does this president, I mean, you know him, you've worked with him. How mm -hmm. does this president and his administration deal with that? The thing about Joe Biden is, I used to, I've said this hundreds of times, literally in media interviews during the campaign. The man is an unconditional lover. I've never seen him give up on love. Never. I've never heard him described like that, by the way. And, <laughs> and that is what he is. Because after all these hundreds of interviews, I started thinking, you know, because I could describe so, I use so many adjectives to describe the man because he's so real and he's so beautiful. And he's such a beautiful human being. But then I started realizing, you know what it is? He loves you first. Right. I mean, he just loves you first. I've, watched, I've seen it go up to people. He doesn't ask you, are you repub? Are you a red state? Are you blue state? Are you black, brown, white, yellow, green, pink? Who do you love? Who'd you marry? He doesn't ask you all that. He just loves you now. So what does he do? I think he stays the course. I don't think he changes who he is. Uh, I, I feel like I can personally testify to this approach in life. Right. And I know that you can, too. I'm sure you've had your fair share of setbacks and people who didn't receive you with equality, with dignity, with respect. Right. And what do we do? What did you and I do? Same thing Joe Biden has to do. Stay the course. Do not change your core values. Keep loving. Keep treating people with dignity. At the end, I still believe karma, goodness, whatever you want to you know, uh, attribute it to. Some people have religious beliefs, but whoever, whoever you think goodness and love and kindness comes from, just stay the course, dadgummit. Just stay the course. And I think that's what the president has to do. What would you say is this president's biggest weakness? Oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. It's interview number 746. <laughs> And I can't believe Tanya Acker, <laughs> you can't believe it. No one's asking you that. Wow. Okay. I would say his greatest weakness, you know, I, I'm going to go out on a limb. His greatest weakness is also his greatest strength. And that is that he, I think he starts with a fundamental belief that everybody's coming from a good place. Mm. And unfortunately, that is a weakness at times. When it's like a chess game, and I, I think I call it just fundamental human dynamics. So if you always assume that, Tanya, you're coming from a good place, unfortunately, if there's one thing I learned the last four and a half years, is that's just not true. Everybody's and, not everybody's not coming from a good place. No, Everyone no, doesn't share no, the same values. No. Everybody doesn't even believe in truth or in advocating for truth. So, so that unconditional lover? There's his weakness too, right? It's it's a beautiful strength. It's a beautiful way to be, but it also, to your question, can be unfortunately a weakness as well because it puts you in a situation where you are uh, vulnerable. Let me ask you <laughs> this. Uh, if you look at the state of the country now, we're seeing a number of bills being passed in state legislatures which would restrict the right to vote. They are, they seem to be premised um, on this falsy, uh, they, they seem to be premised on the, the falsehoods around uh, the 2020 election having been stolen um, in some way, which has neither been proven. That's a theory that's been tested in courts. It's been tested in courts by uh, oh, judges yeah. appointed uh, by uh, the last president, and that there are no facts for that. However, 
that, that lie is now being used to give rise to uh, a lot of restrictive voting legislation around the country. How do people respond to that? Because it seems like, you know, the political battlefield is no longer being waged in the realm of ideas, right? So it's not, mm -hmm. should we have more government or less government? Or how do we justify government? Mm -hmm. It seems to be more like, if my guy doesn't win, I'm going to just take my toys, call the process corrupt, and yeah. try to make it harder for people who don't agree with me uh, to vote. How do you proceed in this kind of uh, really charged environment? There's two things I'd like, to, look, there's two things I'd like to share with you about this. One, as Mrs. Obama taught us, uh, I, if I was going to take the high road, I would do, I would say to you, and I do believe this, I do believe this from the bottom of my heart, but it's not quite the entire answer today, right? But part of the answer is to, to obey Mrs. Obama because she's right. And in that case, I would say what I try to do, I try, I fall short and I fail all the time at this, but I still believe we've got to keep trying to find common ground. Uh, I, I think every, just because somebody doesn't agree with me, uh, you know, or I just cannot grasp how they could continue to perpetuate this big lie, how somebody could engage in such lunacy, it is literally borders on loco, as we say in the Latino community, right? And 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 yet I've got to I've got to remember what Mrs. Obama says. Right, we still have to try to find common ground. I'm going to set that aside. That is who I am, and that's what I strive to do. To answer your question, though, I've never thought I would see such a divisive, you know, like you said, emotionally charged division. It's not just division; it's emotionally charged, as you said. Yeah. I'm going to say something I haven't said in a long, long time. I, I don't say this lightly, and it brings me tremendous sadness to say it, but I, I have to tell you, I really believe 75% of this division, 75% in my eyes of everything we're experiencing right now, as you so perfectly pointed out, it's not, this, it's not fiscal conservative versus this, it's not Republican, it's not. It's racism, Tanya. It is old-fashioned hateful, ugly racism. And there's no other rational explanation why legislatures are trying to restrict access to voting because they know exactly who they're restricting. Don't Let's not kid ourselves here. And I don't want to mince any words and I'm tired of people tiptoeing around this. This is flat out racism. And you know what? You just go look and see where it is and you can see and you know who started this. I don't want to say his name because I can't stand him. I'm not going to I'm not going to say his name, but we all know who gave these people permission. OK, I, back then I used to say, I know what it is to come out of the closet. And he gave the racists permission to come out of their closet. Well, and you know, it's it's interesting because when you look at the history of these voting restrictions, it's not new. I mean, there have been measures and efforts to uh, attempt restrict. After attempt after exactly. Attempt after attempt after attempt. Uh, my mother grew up in Jim Crow, Mississippi. None of this is new. That's why, like, to her and, you know, my dad, like voting is a sacrament. Oh, you do yes, it because absolutely. people died for the right. And we're still seeing, we're still seeing efforts to restrict it. These are not things that just started with the no. 2020 election. Um, but what you said is that now they've become re-legitimized. They, They're at the surface. They it's came back out, at the you surface. You know what I'm saying? They were always percolating to your point. It, it's, it, we can't pretend that it, racism had gone away, but we made it to where you would be ashamed and you should be embarrassed of yourself if you thought that or felt it or, God forbid, express it. Made it okay. It's now come to the surface. It's actually people are out there visible and vocal again. Let's, to your point about your incredible parents, and, and their upbringing in Mississippi, they, they, they experienced when it was visible and vocal. But thank God you and I have had the privilege of growing up 
uh, in an environment and in a country where it at least had been tampered down, right? Not anymore. I think it's back up again. So you asked, what do we do? I think we do what the people of Georgia did. I think we do what the people of Arizona did, right? And Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. You get out, you coalesce, you collaborate, we come together, we create community, we stick together, we become vocal ourselves. Not violent, not violent, but vocal. What did John Lewis teach us? Good trouble. In an environment like this, how do you find common ground? And what are the areas, Mo, for common ground? Where do you, oh, see, uh, where do you see ripe opportunity? First of all, I'm going to tell you, I hope you have me back because I love having this conversation with you. I am, Yay, I'm, come back. I'm really appreciative and I'm so grateful for these very, very important questions because I think we have to have this dialogue. Um, so look, I think that I'll tell you where I do it. That's all I can speak of is to my own experience, right? In my own life. And I'll tell you where I start every single time, Tanya. And it does disarm. And that is, I always say, hi, what's do, do your parents, do you have a husband, a wife? Do you have children? And they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I'll go, do you love them? And they go, of course. Well, I have somebody I love too. And I've always found that the first place to find common ground is to remind both sides, oh, well, you love people too. You love a family. I have a family, right? I have a spouse. You have a spouse. You have children. I have children. You have parents. I have parents. And I always start there. I really do. I say we both love. Now, that doesn't work. I move to things like Okay, so what do you, do you have aspirations? Do you have dreams? What do, you, what do you wake up every morning and aspire to do? You wanna make more money? You wanna be at peace? Do you wanna become more spiritual? You wanna get closer to God? What is it that drives you? And then I know I can find something in that bucket that we have in common, right? Well, and you know, you just hit on something uh, that I want to talk about further, because when you talk about common dreams, common aspirations, mm -hmm. and this dovetails to your show, Unicorn Hunters, mm -hmm. um, I personally think that the economy, as strange as this may sound, but uh, the economy and our joint, you know, like it or not, we are all connected in the business of this economy. Uh, if you are a worker, you need a business, you need somebody who believes in that business, who's willing to invest her or his capital and get something Absolutely. going. If you are that person investing capital, you better gosh darn be sure that you need people to show up, believe in the work, believe in what they're doing, believe in the mission and feel That's like right. they're getting something out of it. You know, So we've really pitted people against one another because I think it makes for a really clever soundbite. A lot of folks don't think that capitalism still works. I, I am going to hazard a guess that you are not one of those folks. I know it. You know, you're a business consultant. You've got this great new business series uh, that I want to hear more about. What do you say to people, especially, you know, folks younger than us who are grow, who've grown up at a time where they yeah. have lived through recession and pandemic? Mm -hmm. uh, they've seen bailouts, bail out mm -hmm. everybody, but, you know, themselves and their and, you know, and, and their families. Um, what do you say to people who just don't believe that the American dream works for them, or that it's a dream well, that only some and that very privileged people can have. What do you I, say to those I, folks? I want to make sure my, I'm going to mention to my publicist that I hope that that entire question right there, he shares with everybody I do an interview with about the show, because that was the best pivot to the show. Let me tell you why. I actually going to shock you. I agree that capitalism is not working. I'll tell you why it's not working. It's because it's not working for everyone, right? And I am a believer that we will not have equality, whether it's racial, whether it's gender, whether it's sexual orientational equality, 
whatever the category is, we're not going to get there until we have economic parity. So when I was brought this idea, I co-created this show, Unicorn Hunters, for the very reason you just asked, because capitalism is not working for everybody. Why? Because not everyone has access to wealth creation. And so if you are a sweeping the floors at the Ralphs or the pavilions or a Safeway or a giant on the East Coast, right? Or you are the CEO of a multi-hundred million dollar company. Why shouldn't you both have access to wealth creation? So we created the show. I'm co-creator. I co-produced it. And now I'm co-starring in it. And I have to tell you something for a chubby little gay Latino boy from South Texas. This is a dream come true at the age of 60, Tanya. Okay. And why did I do the show? Why am I so excited and passionate about it? For the very reasons you just raised, which is for the first time, because of the Jobs Act, by the way, in 2012, under President Obama's leadership, right? Congress passed the Jobs Act and it opened up the world of investing to crowdfunding and changed some of the regulatory environment uh, for other ways for accredited investors and the ability to advertise and generally advertise, all these changes. And, and because of that, we're able to do unicorn hunters, right? And what we're doing, let me just quickly, I'm sorry, I'm taking so long. No, let me just please. quickly tell you the format of the show so people can get excited. Because what we're doing is every week, we bring you a company that is what we consider a potential future unicorn. That means that they will someday reach the valuation of a billion dollars with a B. That's what a unicorn is in business, right? And so what we did is we they're vetted through a broker dealer outside of us, outside of the show, and they come before us and they get to do their elevator pitch for the first time to the world globally, right? And they come before what we call the circle of money. And in that circle is me, uh, Lance Bass, who you might remember from NSYNC, right? Sure. Who's now become a very successful investor and businessman. Uh, Steve Wozniak, the Woz, wow. co-founder of Apple. Yes. Rosie Rios, a former United States treasurer. Her signature's on most of our currency in our wallets or purses right now. So you can see what I'm, what we did, right? There's This is called a circle of money. And all we are is representing all of you around the world, trying to ask the right questions so that you, the masses, we call it the democratization of access to wealth creation. So who are the businesses that are invited to participate? Do they have to reach some preliminary threshold before they yeah. can be some, some presented with ones. the, yeah. So yeah. Who, who gets there? Who gets, who, well, gets it's, to, it's, who gets to be in the circle of money? Yeah, yeah, they get to come to the circle of money and, and then uh, that sits on the web platform, unicornhunters.com and you can take two months if you want to, to go watch each episode. Every two weeks, we introduce a new one. Those companies, by the way, are everything from biopharma innovative products and new technologies, new services that are going to impact people's lives and change the world. Now, the criteria that you're asking of, um, it's very, very pretty simplistic, to be honest with you. Each one of them has to have already have raised two, three, four million dollars. We, we, we like to see that they've raised money from some source of a credible source of capital, right? Because fundamentally, the problem here, by the way, is African-Americans, Latinos, LGBTQ, and women receive less than 2% of all venture capital in the world. So how are we going to have that economic parity if venture capitalists and Wall Street types are not investing in our folks, right? So we're changing that because now anybody in the world, the housewife in Bogota, the grad student in, in, in Nairobi, the, mid, the middle midlife professional in Kansas City, all equal when it comes to unicorn hunters. Because if you can have $100 and you want to invest 100 after you watch the show, right? After you watch everything, you hear us grill this company, you hear us deliberate about them, and then you hear each of us, of the seven of us, decide whether we are individually investing. Wow. So cool, companies right? come on the show, yep. you all grill them. 
Yep. Um, I have some familiarity with that. So people I come in front you of you, do. you grill them. And then you and your colleagues, your co-panelists decide yeah. if you're going to invest. And then you give America, uh, the viewers, and the world, and op- the world an opportunity yeah. to yes. invest. And the heart and soul of the show, Tanya, is access. And, and we're creating access to the investment ecosystem. Why shouldn't that lady sitting in Tokyo, why shouldn't she get to invest? Look, let me be clear. We're very clear about this on the show. We are not broker dealers. We're not financial advisors. We just present these companies to the world. You as an individual have to decide after you see the information, you click on the link on our web platform and go to the broker dealer site, right? See the PPM, learn about the terms that are that company's offering. That's all on you as an investor. But what's important here is to know your risk tolerance. If all you have is $100 and you then need you to pay your electric bill, that. you cannot invest that. This is not, the show is not for you. you watch the show, but That's do right. not take your no. bread and butter money. No. Don't take your no. uh, rent money, right. your mortgage no. money. That is not That's for right. the show. That's right. And, and it's important to know your risk tolerance depending on your particular life journey and your personal circumstances. So we're, we want to remind people of that because I don't, you know, I go to, the, I, I'm going to fess up on your podcast. I've never said this in 740 interviews or whatever. I play video poker. And when I'm at the casino playing video poker, I do look down the aisle, right? And I go, I don't think that person probably should be here. You know, I don't mean it in a judgmental way, but I'm like, I think they're playing with their electric bill money. Don't right? play and with it, your electric bill money. And it breaks my heart. And I just want to be clear about unicorn hunters. Do not, please, please, this is about being, when you're ready on your journey and you have that extra hundred dollars, you have that extra thousand dollars, you have that extra $10,000, whatever it is in your life. If you see a company on our show, the reason we're putting them before you, is they're all pre-IPO, they're beyond startup, they're already you know, their product's pretty much already proven. They're already, you know, pretty, you know, further along in the uh, growth cycle. Um, and, but please use your best judgment and, and remember to know your own risk tolerance. But for God's sakes, come watch the show. Come join the cause because it's a cause. It's about giving everyone, everyone a place at the table of the opportunity to create wealth. So, Mo, let me ask you this, because you talk about being a a gay Latin man growing up in Texas. What's your advice to young people who, you know, whether or not they see themselves reflected, they don't, you know, whether or not they see someone in their package, they may or may not, they don't feel reflected. They don't feel represented. They don't feel like they have an opportunity. They don't come from fancy families. College... You know, I, look, I have been out of law school for 25 years. The expense that it now takes to get the education that I had is exorbitant. Exorbitant. I mean, it wasn't cheap then, but now through the no. roof. So out, of, see, out of reach. It totally feels. out of reach. So for a lot of people, education seems out of reach. They don't have family connections, you know, moms or dads who like work at the firm or play at the club with so-and-so no. who can get them an internship. There are so many young people who do not see a path forward. Uh, what is your advice to them? And how? what's the first step? Somebody is looking at their lives. They don't like their job. They don't like what they see as their immediate prospects. Uh, what is your first bit of advice that you give to, to, the, the to, to that person? The first bit of advice that I would share with anybody is only, only I can share because I had to learn it myself. And it's what I went through on my journey. And, and l- l- such a powerful question again. You were just phenomenal. What? Um, but let me just say, let me, let me take a step back if I could, just for a second, if you'll give me two seconds to just Please. say something important in relation to this. Because I can't give the advice if I don't share this. I want to remind everybody, and I think this is part of the answer, remember Every single one of us, regardless of whether your parents are members of the country club or you are in the, in the group that Tanya just described, 
whether you have come from money or you come from poverty, whether you were born on a dirt floor like my father or you were born in a mansion. I don't care. At the end of the day, we're all equal. You know why? Because every single one of us has three basic things in common. And this is the first part of the advice. Remember, we all just want to love. We all just want to be loved. And every one of us, Tanya, no matter where you are on the socioeconomic spectrum, no matter what color, no matter who you love, no matter what deity you believe in, right? Every one of us has experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. And every one of us is vulnerable and volatile as a human being and a member of the human family. And that makes us equal, Tanya. So that's my first piece of advice is remember, you are equal. Even if it feels out of reach, even if the dream feels unachievable, remind yourself, no, it is achievable because I'm equal. Second piece of advice, my life changed when I was bullied as a young guy. Remember, I grew up knowing I was gay since I was six in a cowboy Texas mentality, Latino, Catholic, the son of a prominent family. I knew since I was six, I couldn't be who I am. I couldn't say who I was, couldn't express it, live it, be it, do it, nothing. And so for the first 17 of my, years of my life, I did everything a Texas boy was supposed to do. I played football, I excelled. I played basketball, I excelled. I played baseball, I went hunting, I went fishing. I did it all. And Gratefully, and thank God, I enjoyed it all. But at 17, the juxtaposition, the inner conflict got too severe. So I quit playing sports. And my, my best friends that played football with me, Tanya, turned on me. And they called me a faggot every day of my life for six months. And I, I actually went into a room to take my own life at the age of 17. Wow. So my answer to, to your question is very personal. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like that, that life isn't worth it, that it's not achievable, that it's not, you know, that you can't reach your, your goals, that you can't be who you are, that you can't soar like an eagle. But the damn truth is that you can. You can. We control our own destiny, Tanya. I'm sorry. We cannot let everyone around us nor anybody else control our destiny. Only we can. Only you can. Oh. First off, uh, thank you for sharing that uh, with me and with my audience. I think that it is important for us all to remember that we all have some pain. And what you Absolutely. just said is a reminder that you right. can use that pain to propel you. I mean, you know, I talk That's about right. my parents a lot. My mom from Mississippi, my dad originally right. from uh, West Virginia, Grew up African American at a time when, you know, look, there is nothing that these that is going on today that my parents and grandparents haven't seen in space. Oh, and so they experience. You know, exactly. And, and and what you just said resonates so much because it really is a reminder uh, that at some point, regardless of where we are or how tough it is, you have to just not, you have to be the decider of your fate. That's exactly I mean, and it will right. be hard but you've got to believe in it, you know, and, and kind of look at that thing that's right in front of you and try to do great at the thing that's right in front of you. Absolutely. Maybe it's babysitting your siblings while Absolutely. your mom works that third job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that belief and a feeling that knowing that you are designed, you know, you're destined for great things. Yeah. Uh, it really all starts there. That is such wonderful right advice. Right and in thank here, you. right? It's, it's right, right in here. here. It's, it's in our it's, core. It's your core. It's your soul. And it's, it's, you know, when you realize that you're worthy, it was that light bulb moment when I didn't take my life and I realized, wait a minute. Even then, I, I, there was a light bulb moment. And that's what I hope all of your listeners and your viewers will take from this is find your light bulb moment where you realize, damn it, I'm worthy. I'm unique. I'm special. There is no one else like me. And I am going to determine my destiny. I'm not letting anybody else determine my destiny. And I, when you have that one moment, 
boom, you are on your way. And we can't look back. We have to stick together. All of us, we can come together and each of us as we're determining our own destiny, come together to determine our collective destiny too, I think. Find your light bulb moment. Mo Vella, I, you are such a gift. Thank you for being here you today. Are. Oh my gosh. And, and honestly- And since we're two blocks I, away from each other, you now like have to have lunch away. with me. Exactly, exactly. We I'll see you in 10 minutes. Me. I'll see you in 10 <laughs> minutes. Seriously, I, I believe that what you have just shared, someone's going to hear and you are going to inspire somebody else to be, find their light bulb moment and they're going to inspire somebody else. Uh, you are a butterfly that's creating a butterfly effect. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for being and here. Thank you for talking about the show. Unicornhunters.com. It premieres Monday, by And the way. we can see it on Amazon Prime. Yeah, Where else yeah, can uh, you see uh, it? Yeah, uh, on YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. But the best place to go, frankly, is unicornhunters.com. Um, Every two weeks, we'll have a new episode for the next uh, five episodes. So please come join the cause. And if you feel compelled, invest. Unicornhunters.com, all about democratizing wealth, even if you don't have the funds to invest, and a lot of people may not. Then just just come learn how. Just watch, learn how, look at how. You know, you will also provide such a valuable service by just the questions that you ask these potential entrepreneurs. That is the objective. You're going to, it's going to be, it's going to be educational. You're going to help some other people grow wealth. Uh, And entertaining too, by the way. And it's going to be fun. Because if you have ever listened to Bye, Bye, Bye by NSYNC and you can come and watch Lance Bass, I have to end with this. You know where Lance (laughs) is from. The same place Tanya Acker's from, Mississippi. No, I'm from L.A., but my mom's from Mississippi. Oh, oh, your mama. (laughs) Okay, okay. I'm a native. But, you know, second generation. Okay, your mama needs to watch the show because she and Lance are the Mississippi connection there. We will and, definitely and we were, be watching. I, I just had dinner with Lance last night to celebrate his birthday, and he was talking about growing up in Clinton, Mississippi. We will definitely be watching unicornhunters.com. Premieres next week. You can see it on their website. You can see it on Amazon Prime, but go to yeah. unicornhunters.com. Mo oh, Vela, yeah, you're, amazing. You're, you're amazing. Right back, brother. Please come back. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. Thanks for having me. Speak soon. 